Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, bonamuli wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast and iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award nominee. We are so delighted and so, so, so very honored that you join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show. Tell your kids' teachers, their librarians, their principal. And please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app on Audible, Amazon Music, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Podcast Addict, Ghana, Himalaya, wherever you find your podcast. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by I Am Musical, Adventures of Waffles, written by Barbara Brown. Waffles is a feisty and funny dog who cannot play an instrument, sing, or compose music, but somehow is convinced that she is musical. In this book, Crouton the Corgi spends a day trying to figure out how his best friend Waffles could possibly be musical when all she does is make a musical mess everywhere she goes. This story is an opportunity for children to see themselves as valid and important contributors to our musical culture, regardless of their musical abilities, while also being the first of its kind to remind children and their parents that music belongs to all of us. Get your copy today. I Am Musical, Adventures of Waffles, written by Barbara Brown. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by And the Trees Talk Back, written and illustrated by Frederick J. Burns, a gem in children's literature. And the Trees Talk Back is an enchanting and magical story about a young girl named Amanda who discovers she can talk to trees. The magical adventure and whimsical tree illustrations will delight adults and children of all ages and will inspire kindness, empathy, caring, and courage to stand against evil and give them a new appreciation of the trees that surround us. I I love this book. It's a great way to inspire kids to see those who are different and who've been overlooked and to understand that that we can all be wonderful friends and that we're all part of a beautiful human family. Get your copy today. And the Trees Talk Back by Frederick J. Burns. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by A is for Always, an adoption alphabet written by Linda Cutting. Linda tells us that this book is inspired by her daughter, A Chinese-American girl adopted into an all-white family when she was only six. She stomped down the hall carrying two books, demanding to know why her adoption book was different from her white brothers. Linda says her daughter asked her to write a book for adoptees from everywhere so no one would feel left out. A book that addressed the challenges as well as the joys of adoption. You and your kids are going to love this beautiful book. It's a beautiful message, and the illustrations are absolutely beautiful. Every page shows a different adopted family of cuddly animals welcoming and cherishing a new child. A is for always. It hit number one on Amazon for new releases. It should be in your family library. Get your copy today. A is for always, an adoption alphabet by Linda Cutting. Join us right now from the beautiful state of Florida. Our guest is here today to celebrate her Lonely series. And her first book in the series is called The Lonely Side of the Christmas Tree. Please welcome to the show, Jessica McLean. Hey, Jessica, how are you? I am doing good. How are you? I'm wonderful. I think I'm doing better than The Lonely Side of the Christmas Tree. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you are. Yeah. So <laughs> when we're talking about The Lonely Side of the Christmas Tree, we're talking about the side that's facing the wall, that gets doesn't get dressed up at all. Am I right? Yes, that is absolutely correct. Yeah. So tell me um, uh, about the story. 
All right. So um, the story I actually wrote in 2018, um, I was a teacher in a traditional school. Um, I now am a virtual teacher, but when I used to teach in person, I was next to my sweet mate. Um, my partner teacher and I were talking. It was close to Christmas time, and um, we were talking about the lonely side of the tree, just kind of decorating for Christmas, and she was talking about how the back side of the tree doesn't get decorated. And um, we were kind of talking about it that night. I ended up going home and writing out this story in the notes on my phone, just kind of, I like to write poetry. Um, so I wrote it in rhyming form um, in the notes on my phone. I came to school the next day and read it to her and we just like talked about how great it was. And then I never did anything with it. Um, so I, this past summer had um, in 2023, decided to finally take that story and create something out of it. So that story that's just been sitting, I kind of now have turned it into what I want to make a lonely series about these inanimate objects that um, don't have a voice and they get to kind of speak up and talk about why they're feeling lonely. So the first one is the lonely side of the Christmas tree. And like you mentioned, it's that back side of the tree that doesn't get decorated and it finally gets to speak up and talk about why it's feeling lonely and why we should decorate it so that it's not feeling lonely anymore and the whole side, the whole tree can now be decorated equally. I have a feeling, I don't know where this is coming from, it's just a feeling, I have a feeling that you're not so much celebrating while, while you're, you're talking about this thing that we all know exists, the lonely side of the tree and finding mm -hmm. a voice. You might be using that story to help motivate kids who feel lonely and left out. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. So all of my stories, even though they are about these inanimate objects that don't have a voice and they get this voice, it's teaching a lesson. So, you know, the kind of lessons that you get from the Christmas story is, you know, if you are feeling that loneliness or you feel like you deserve something that you don't have, you should speak up about it. And you have that opportunity to do that in whatever kind of unique way you need to do that. So, you know, the Christmas tree kind of starts to fight back and tell why it's feeling lonely and this little girl gets to decorate it. And by the end, the tree feels complete because the girl has finally taken care of it. And now it has that wholesome feeling. And all of the stories that I'm planning to do in this series, I've already written a few of them, um, are all going to kind of have that little bit of extra lesson in them while it's also some sort of um, fun and unique way to tell the story. As a teacher, both traditionally and, and now virtually, you're, you're working with kids, and one of the things that we're hearing these days is that we're kind of, you know, now that we're through the pandemic, we're kind of in, in an epidemic of loneliness, that more and more kids are feeling isolated and alone. Is that something that you've experienced in your in experience? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, when I was teaching in person, it was pre COVID. Um, so, you know, even back then there were still those mental health things that, you know, we always had to look out for as teachers. I teach second grade. So the kids are young and they don't necessarily understand those feelings yet. So it's kind of teaching them that, that social, the social cues, understanding kind of how to cope with different things, whether that's feeling lonely, whether that's something they're going through at home with friends, whatever it is, we're always trying to kind of teach them those skills that they need to cope with things and understand how they're feeling, those big feelings, those little feelings. Um, and then, of course, post-COVID, you know, everything has changed, especially in the education world. Um, you know, families aren't sure how to get what they need, the resources for their kids so that they can feel like they have the social um, socialization that they need and all of the things. I think things have gotten better socially since then, um, but it's still that mental health stigma and trying to see how to give our kids what they need. Um, so I think it's super important that um, we have those resources for kids and have the resources for parents for their kids um, and having a teacher to be able to step in and provide those resources as well is great. So especially in the virtual world, we have counselors, we have lots of mental health resources. Um, and I know that, of course, traditional schools have that as well. But it's it's so important for those resources to be available easily. I, I you know, I want to explore this the idea of virtual schools with you. But first, you know, let's talk a little bit more about about kids and lonely. And, and, and as you're talking about that, I'm looking back and thinking about my experience of almost 100 years ago in elementary school, but more recently, my kids, when they were 
uh, they're now adults, but when they were in school, and I have very vivid memories of certain kids in their classes that were obviously felt left out. And even that, and, and my kids were very fortunate to go to, to schools and be part of classes that were very inclusive and welcoming and mm-hmm. um, would reach out to those kids who are lonely. But there, it seems that there are some kids who get to school and whether or not it's, uh, you know, they're shy or somewhere on the spectrum, but they, mm-hmm. they just seem to be like, you know, I'm, I don't like being lonely, but I'm, I'm kind of more comfortable over here by myself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I definitely know exactly what you're talking about. It's kind of like, they're so used to it that they just kind of stick with it. It almost becomes their identity to just kind of stay the way that they are because they don't want to get out of their comfort zone. Um, I think it's super important for, um, you know, in that situation, especially in a traditional school for the teachers to kind of do what they can to, um, I don't want to say force or push or anything like that, but kind of give the opportunity for those kids to have the chances to interact with others. And even in the virtual world, um, you know, I, my partner teacher and I have a little class time that we do with our kids once a week for an hour. And we give them a lot of opportunity to be able to interact with each other. Um, because I have families tell me in the very first call that I have with them, you know, he's shy or he's nervous or whatever it is because They don't necessarily have that interaction at home with other kids. And I'm like, I encourage for them to come because even if they just come and listen, it still gives them that chance to be among other kids that are talking at their level and, um, you know, learning at their level. And it gives them the chance to kind of hear those conversations. And then when they feel comfortable, they have that opportunity to join in those conversations. So it's kind of a little by little piece that sometimes maybe that's what they prefer is to just stay that way. But if they start to kind of feel that welcoming and then like feel that they can kind of fit in with that, I think that that's important that they can inch their way into feeling a little more comfortable with not needing that lonely feeling and kind of craving a little bit more. Let's talk a little bit about this idea of virtual school. I know everybody around the country kind of uh, was forced into that situation. Um, Florida didn't stay in that as long as everybody else did. <laughs> uh, my wife taught school for 34 years. She recently okay. retired, and, and uh, the p- pandemic years were her, her last years. Mm-hmm. Um, she was a special educator, so she actually was back in the classroom um, quicker than, than most of her colleagues. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that was frustrating about that whole experience was they took – classroom teachers and they said okay now you have to teach on zoom and they didn't really adapt they did what they were doing in the classroom through a screen and they said okay well this is online learning and as somebody who who took a lot of classes online i'm shaking my head because i'm going that ain't online learning (laughs) So, but but I'm just a dope. So tell me what online learning looks like at your school. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because I had a little mixture of the two. So, of course, when COVID first happened, um, we all went into survival mode. Um, Nobody was used to it. Nobody knew what to do. The districts did everything they could to kind of implement something. Um, And that's kind of how us teachers and families and students and parents, everybody was just kind of like, Let's just do what we can to get some sort of learning for the end of the year. Luckily, it was the end of the year, and we were kind of in that ending um, era of the school year where it's kind of like we're still finishing up some of the things we were working on, but we were also wrapping up some things. So um, the end of that school year was really just supporting our kids through things, trying to meet with them when we could, um, working through it all together Um So yeah, that end of the school year was kind of like survival and everybody was trying to figure it out. Going into that next school year, I was still doing e-learning. So I was still doing that online learning through the school that I was still at. Um, So I had second graders that chose, the families chose to be at home. There was the option of going back to school. So we were about half and half. Um, So doing e-learning that next year, we had much more structure. Um, It was still a learning mode. Um, We were all still kind of learning as we went but we were figuring it out. We were getting on Zooms with our kids to teach their lessons. Uh, We had specific Zoom times that we were meeting with them. We still 
um, assign things outside of those Zoom times as well. But we were on Zoom every day for a few hours. Um, transitioning into Florida Virtual School was interesting um, in, in the best way. So, um, you know, there were great things about e-learning and there's awesome things about Florida Virtual School. So Florida Virtual School, I am part of the FLEX program. I'm a second grade teacher in the FLEX side. And what that means is we have a FLEX side and a full-time side. Full-time is more like a traditional school. Um, so they are on Zoom more often. They um, are on like a strict schedule of submitting. Um, and with the flex side, it's much more flexible. We have, um, you know, we check attendance by them submitting each week, but all of the students with Florida Virtual School are homeschool students. Um, so their parents are the ones that are working with them day in and day out, but they're using our curriculum to um, meet their standards, make sure that they're understanding the content, um, working through the grade. And as teachers, we are helping to, you know, grade their work, meet with them, have that accountability. Um, we talk with them monthly. We meet with them on Zoom um, to kind of check in with them and do little assessments with them. So we still have that accountability piece, but it's a little bit more flexible in the sense that they have the opportunity to use our live class times that we offer but they can also just work through at the pace that works for them and they can attend those class times if they want. So it's not so much that they have to be on Zoom all the time. It's more so that they're kind of taking that independence and working on the work. They're doing lessons, they're doing assignments. So it's definitely a little bit different structure. Um, they're working more with their parents and then um, of course having that independence of doing their assignments. And then as teachers, we are there to support um, we are there to grade. We are there to um, check in with them, make sure that they, if they have questions, we kind of guide them through that. We can meet with them on Zoom as needed. So it kind of gives that opportunity to um, meet them where they are, which is really great. Yeah. It it sounds, uh, you know, like you're, it, it's the best of both worlds. You're, you know, you're the, the homeschool parents are there, they're involved, but if there's something, they hit a snag, they're trying to teach something that they don't quite understand or they understand it, but their kids aren't getting it and they don't know how to help their kids get it, they can turn to an expert like you um, to try some different strategies. One of the yeah. memories that uh, I, I really wish I could erase it from my mind, but I, I can't, there was a, a, a picture um of when, when, when school started going hybrid and the kids were going virtually half the mm -hmm. time and in person half the time and they would split, split a class. So every day there'd be a group of kids in the classroom and a group of kids at home on Zoom. And there was a picture of this one particular class in Boston where all the kids in person at the school were sitting at their desks behind their screen watching their teacher who was standing in front of them on Zoom. And mm -hmm. I, I, I wanted to tear my, well, I don't have much hair left to tear, <laughs> but I wanted to tear what little bit in my mm -hmm. head was left. I it just, it, mm -hmm. it boggled my mind. Yeah. It, it's crazy how we had to just kind of do what we had to do to meet the needs of all the kids because some, some families preferred to be home and some families preferred to be in school. And we had to try to meet every kid where they, where they wanted, what they needed. Um, so yeah, having that, we, I did not have to do the hybrid. I imagine that had to be very stressful as a teacher um, and very confusing as a kid, mm -hmm. um, especially those younger kids, just not totally grasping why some of their kids or why some of their friends are on a computer screen and some of them are right there with them. Um, so I imagine, especially like those K through two kiddos, um, that had to be a lot for them. So I know the past few years of education have been so confusing. Um, such a toss up in, you know, these past few years, just the education world in general. Um, but I do feel like we're kind of getting back on track of having that normal school setting for everyone. And then of course we have those opportunities like the virtual school that I work for, for those families that still choose to do that. I found that a lot of families since COVID have found that virtual school is actually more beneficial for them, more mm -hmm. beneficial for their kids. They have the flexibility to travel. Um, if they have like a sport that they're very invested in, they have the opportunity to do that. And it just gives them so much time back. Um, me as a teacher, I have gained a better work-life balance by being a virtual teacher. Um, I still get to build those connections with my families that I loved so much in the classroom um, because I get to talk with them all the time. So I don't lose out on those connections that I so badly loved or so much, so loved so much when I was teaching in person, I still get to make those connections, which I think is my favorite part of teaching. Um, and 
you know, I feel like kids are finally in that place where they're enjoying um, being virtual. Whereas when it first happened, it was kind of like some families were kind of forced into it and you could tell that it was hard for them. Yeah. So I think we're finally at that area where like, things are comfortable and it's definitely a better place than having that hybrid model that was just so hard for everybody to handle. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that the next book in the lonely series is about to be released. Um, tell us, uh, uh, yeah. who, which, which person or uh, which character will be be meeting which lonely character. All right. So my next book, um, by the time that you guys are listening to this, my next book will be announced. So I will go ahead and share. It is going to be called The Lonely Vegetables. Um, So growing up, I was a kid who um, did not eat vegetables. I still to this day am not a big vegetable fan. Um, I do eat some, but I am not a big vegetable person. So when I was writing this one, it 100% felt like I was writing about myself. And especially writing about my kids because my kids are the same way with their vegetables. So these vegetables are speaking up and they are sharing why they are so important, why they feel so lonely. They're tired of everything else on the plate being eaten and then being left alone or thrown away. Um, So it's kind of teaching that lesson of where the vegetables are coming from, why they're so important. Also sharing that lonely voice and giving them a voice to be able to speak up. Yeah. I love that. And I'm, I, too, am somebody who wasn't a big and isn't a big vegetable fan until till I discovered that I could cook the vegetables into my rices, like fried rice. And uh, now it's just like, oh, yeah, pile it in. I don't care what because I'm not going to notice eating. It's just all going to taste good. Mm-hmm. And, yes, I've definitely turned into that person where if it gets cooked down into something, I'm not as worried about it. Um, but yeah, this story, it's so fun. Um, my illustrator is wonderful. I used the same illustrator with my first book that I'm using for this one. And she was super excited because she told me she loves drawing vegetables. So she's already sent me some of those little character sketches. The vegetables are adorable. I am just so excited to share this one because I think it's going to be great for those kids that don't like their vegetables. Hopefully it will give them that encouragement to stop leaving them alone and hopefully start eating them. Yeah. I, well, Talk a little bit before we go, um, just about how much easier it is for kids, and maybe you understand on a little bit diff, diff, deeper level why this is. Why is it kids who typically, if you if you sat them down to talk about feeling lonely, they might nah, nah, nah you know, mm-hmm. put their fingers in their mm-hmm. ears. I don't want to hear about it. But if you're talking to them about a lonely vegetable or a lonely side of a Christmas tree and you're having a conversation about that and we're having fun and we're looking at the pictures and maybe it's an easier way to slide into the whole topic and there's a better chance of of them saying, yeah, you know, sometimes I feel lonely. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's a great point. So um, having these books, of course, to teach lessons outside of feeling lonely, but also that lesson of feeling lonely, I think is awesome because it gives them those characters to relate with. Um, It gives them something to be able to say, okay, I'm not the only one feeling this way. Obviously, there's other people that feel this way. Vegetables feel this way. The Christmas tree feels this way. So they know that they're not the only one that has that feeling of loneliness or feeling like they don't have that voice. And hopefully it will give them that little bit of motivation that they need to be able to say what they need to not have those feelings anymore. Um, So it's definitely fun because being a teacher, I wanted my stories to be more than just stories. I also wanted them to be unique. You know, there's so many stories out there about Christmas or about vegetables, um, but having that unique twist on it that kind of is something different from what we've seen, I think is important because it kind of, you know, it just makes it stand out a little bit more. Um, and it will hopefully kind of, like you said, encourage those kids to feel those underside feelings that they didn't think of by relating to these different characters in the book. Yeah. Hey, Jessa, tell us where we can go to find out more about the lonely side of the Christmas tree, the new books that are coming into the series and a little bit more about you. Yeah. So I am on Instagram and Facebook at J McLean books. Um, McLean is M C L E A N. Um, my website is also www.jmcleanbooks.com. Um, you can go to my website to kind of learn more about me, um, learn about any books that are coming up. You can sign up for my email, um, to receive any of those updates. 
Um, I will be sharing all sorts of updates on Instagram and Facebook about the book. I've already shared a little bit of sneak peeks in there. Um, so you'll be able to see any sort of updates about any upcoming books there as well. Awesome. We've had a great time speaking to the author of The Lonely Side of the Christmas Tree. It is the first in the Lonely series from our guest, Jessa McLean. Hey, Jessa, thanks so much. For, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast and will join us for the next exciting episode of the show. To make sure you don't miss a moment of the show, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Good Pods, Boom Play, Player FM, wherever you find your podcasts. And please be sure to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. You can uh, click on the Parents Click Here button at the top of the page, check out our blog, our certified great reads, and download our free online magazine. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our amazing guests. I also want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Kyoko Ito, Nick Warner, Sydney Swan, Kayla Newland, Kristen Barrett, Hannah Rose. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. You are amazing. You are the most important person in your kid's life, and you make the world a better place every time you choose to read with your kid. I'll be looking for you in the next exciting episode of The Reading with Your Kids Podcast.